Hello and welcome to my channel IELTS Listening. Let's start with one of the best practice tests for improving listening skills. The test is in four part, part one, part two, part three, and part four. Now look at part one. Part one. You will hear a woman phoning about the shared house she is going to move into. First, you have some time to look at questions one to seven. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully to the first part of the conversation and answer questions 1 to 7. Hello? Hello, this is Hilary. I'm calling about the house. I'm moving in next week. Oh yes, Hilary. This is Judith. I met you when you came to look at the house. Yes. I just had a few more questions I wanted to ask. Of course. Well, first, about the rent. I realise I didn't check what it included. Yes, that's important. It includes most things. We don't have to pay extra for heating, for example, just for the telephone, which is fair enough, I suppose. Local taxes are part of the rent, so that's not a worry. That's fine. Then I remember I should have sent my letter of reference to the landlord by now, but I haven't got his address. Yes, you should get that off right away. Address it to Mr Crawley. He's at 14 King Street. Is that in Exford? Yes. And then you'll need to put the postcode, of course. It's AP12... Mm-hmm. 7QT. Got that. Thanks. I also realise I don't know exactly what the house has in the way of equipment. Is there a microwave, for example? There isn't. None of us feels the need. Oh, fine. I'm sure I can do without one, too. What about a hairdryer? Maybe you should bring one, if you need one. I'll buy one, yes. And TV? Oh, yes. We've got two, in fact. Was there anything else? I just wondered if there were any rules. Not really. We share the cleaning, things like that. We do have to be careful about loud music. Yes. So we've agreed that there shouldn't be any loud music after nine and that we don't play music at all in the living room after ten. Up to eleven in your own room's OK, as long as it's not too noisy. That sounds good. And is there somewhere safe I can keep my bike? That's difficult. To be honest... Lots do get stolen round here. We haven't got a garage, so we tend to park ours in the garden so that they're hidden from the street. OK. Now, I hope you like cooking. Yes, I do. Do you all have shared meals? Not very often, actually. But when the weather's good in the summer, we like to have a barbecue together, which we do each Wednesday. We tend to go out at weekends. Sounds fun. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 8 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 8 to 10. Are you familiar with this area? A bit. Actually, there are a few things that I'd like to know the location of. A bank, for example. Yes, there's one quite close. You just go up to the junction near the house, the one where four roads meet, and go straight ahead and then take the second left. It's a little way down there on the left-hand side. That's convenient. Another thing is that I'd like to check my emails quite often. I was wondering how far away an internet cafe was. Well, there are a couple, actually, but one's much cheaper than the other. The one I use is very handy. You just go up to the big junction and then... Well, 
I go straight ahead and then turn right so that it's on the right-hand side. Fine. And one last thing. Uh-huh. I need to go to the post office quite often. I'm hoping there's one quite close to the house. You're in luck. You'd walk up to the big junction and then, if you want a nice route, take the street that's slightly to the right. Then you'd want the second left and you'd find it on the right side of the street. Well, it all sounds great. So, we'll see you in a couple of days' time? Yes. OK. Bye. Bye. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You'll hear two teachers discussing a school trip. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 16. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 16. Oh, there you are, Paul. Do you have a few minutes? Can we think about this year's school trip? Hi, Jean. Yes, of course. Have you got any ideas? I've been looking through some information, and I've brought a few leaflets with me. Here you are. Okay, thanks. Just remind me when the trip is. Next Friday. We'll be leaving at 9 and be back here at around 4, so we've probably got time to visit a couple of places. Let's see. What leaflet have you got there? Central Gardens. Looks like a nice place. It's open from 9 until 6, so we could go there any time we wanted, really. What about there in the morning and then somewhere else in the afternoon? Farmer's Market would be an option first as well, at least until they close at 1. Or we could try Grey Castle. That should be possible in the morning or in the afternoon. Oh, hang on. That's at the weekend. The last admission is at noon on weekdays. Greenhall says the same thing. Queen's Park opens at 8, so we could go there first. Or, according to these times, we could go there on the way back to school. Because they don't close the gates until sunset during the week. Okay, that gives us a few options. We went to Queen's Park a couple of years ago, didn't we? I seem to remember that the pupils really enjoyed it. It'd be nice to go somewhere new as well. I've seen groups from other schools going around Grey Castle. So have I. But then again, maybe we should play it safe and go to Green Hall. At least we've got experience of taking classes around there. Farmer's Market is popular with other schools, though, so it must be interesting. It'd be good to go somewhere where someone can show the pupils around, you know, explain things to them. I've been on a tour around the castle, and they do a really good job. I think they have guides at the hall, too, don't they? It says here that they used to, but don't anymore. You can get shown round Central Gardens, though. I think we'd have to do any explaining if we took the pupils to the market or the park. That wouldn't be a problem, though. No, and at least those two would be free, wouldn't they? I think all the others charge, and we'd have to get the parents to pay some money. I'm sure they wouldn't mind paying if it was a small amount. Let me check the leaflets. There's a special price for large groups at Grey Castle. Oh, but you can get into Central Gardens for nothing. Right. Oh, 
I've just thought of something. We wouldn't need to book anything if we were going to Queen's Park, but what about the other places? Uh, Central Gardens say you need to let them know if there are more than ten people in your group, which would include us. The same at Grey Castle. Farmer's Market says you can just turn up, and so does Green Hall. Right. Well, I suggest we take the pupils to Grey Castle for a tour in the morning. How does that sound? Yes, sounds good. We should contact them to book it as soon as possible. In the afternoon, we can do something a bit more relaxed at the park, and we'll have to think about going to Green Hall another year. Shame Farmer's Market isn't open, but we can't change the day. So that's a decision then. Now, let's think about what we're going to get the pupils to do. It's a school trip, after all, and we should give them some work to do. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 17 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 17 to 20. I think they should know something about the place before they go. That way they know what they're looking at, and they'll be able to write about it better when they get back. I'll put some information together to look at at home and give them copies after the next lesson. Good idea. I'll write something for them to do as they're going round the place. We did a quiz last year, and that worked really well. I'll do the same kind of thing this time. Okay. Now, what about the travel arrangements? How are we getting there? What do you think? I remember one year Mrs. Jackson took her group by bus, and that was a complete nightmare. Hmm. It's quite a long way, isn't it? We could hire a coach for the day, which is what we usually do. Or there's the train. It's rush hour, though, isn't it? So it'll be really crowded. And it'll be more convenient for the rest of the day if we've got our own transport. Yes, we'll do that then. Anything else? Oh, we need to let the parents know what's happening. We could ask the office to call everyone. It would take too long with so many. I know when we send a letter home, there are always a few pupils who lose it. But not all the parents have email yet, so I don't think we have any choice, really. I'll write something and take it to the school office this afternoon. Right. I'll go and tell the pupils the good news. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a discussion between a student, Aldo, and his supervisor, Dr. Hurst, about his research assignment. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 23. Now listen to the first part of the conversation and answer questions 21 to 23. So, Aldo, how's it going so far with your assignment? Not too bad. You're looking at the community around here. That's right. How people perceive the community they are in. Have you made much progress? Hmm. I conducted quite a lot of interviews on the street with local residents. 
Their responses are interesting. I haven't got quite as many yet as I'd like. I had wondered if I'd have language problems, particularly with the different accents. I seem to have managed, though. Having to work in the open has made it harder, and with the cold weather there's been recently, people don't necessarily want to stop and talk like they do if it's nice and sunny. That's something I've had to deal with. Of course, some people are too busy to stop and talk, but that's OK. I see. So, have you formed a good overall picture of how people view the community? To an extent. I've certainly talked to plenty of older people. I guess they may have more time to talk. I still don't really have enough young mothers, though. I've managed to get enough older mothers and children through the schools. That's something I had been worried about. Well, that shouldn't be too hard. Now, how are you going to deal with all the data you've collected? That's the difficult part. I guess I need to run some analyses, but I'm rather unclear about what methods to use. You've told me you're confident about using computers, so you just need some input on choosing programmes. You should attend a statistics seminar. They're held every Friday after the methodology seminars in room 105. That should help you to select an approach. Oh, good. I'll do that. Now you have some time to look at questions 24 to 30. Meanwhile, let's hear something about what you've learned. Yes, I talked to a number of residents. Good. I imagine they didn't always have the same opinions. Views were certainly quite mixed. Take sports facilities. In general, people seem to think they weren't very good. There's no swimming pool in the area, for example. But at the same time, there's a new football training area. It looks very smart to me, but it doesn't seem to get used very much. People seem to prefer sitting around in the parks. They enjoy that, taking picnics and so on. Although they want the council to be more efficient at cleaning, there's a lot of litter. People are obviously very concerned about their children's learning. The general view seems to be that early schooling at primary level is of a good standard in the area, but that this standard declines as children move up through the system. The colleges were criticised in particular. OK, now are you going to collect any more data? Some, I hope. There's a local festival next week and I think the events there will give me some useful opportunities. I talked to a council officer about it all. Good. What does it involve? First, there's a dance show, which I'm sure I'll enjoy. The council explained that the concert hall's being renovated and won't be ready in time, so it's being held in the main square, which I think will be better anyway. At least I'll have more space to wander around in. True. And so I hope to be able to carefully watch the age groups that are there in the audience and make notes about how they interact. So that's one event. Then, the following day, there's another interesting event which I look forward to going along to, and that's a cookery competition. Oh, yes. Interesting. I think so. Yes, that one's being organised in the town hall, which has a big space, apparently. With food and cooking from all the different people in the area... The council officer told me that it'll be a good chance to find out about the different cultures that make up the community. Sounds promising. Then there's one more event I'd like to go along to. The council officer promised me that the courses fair will be interesting. It's going to be in the Langtree Theatre, and the officer said lots of teachers will be there. I've already talked to plenty of them, but he advised me to put some questions to the head of education, who will also be there. That's all very useful. OK, I suggest you come back next... That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. 
Part 4 You will hear a historian giving a presentation about techniques to identify the origin of handwritten books from the Middle Ages. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen and answer questions 31 to 40. My presentation today is on how the science of genetics is being used to shed light on the origin of manuscripts, anything written by hand, produced in the medieval period, that is, the period between the 5th and 15th centuries AD. As many of you know, thousands of medieval handwritten books still exist today, some of them have a clear provenance, that is, we know exactly where and when they were written. But the origin of many manuscripts has been a complete mystery, that is, until 2009, when geneticists started using DNA testing to shed light on their origins. But before looking at the new research, I need to explain something about the way the manuscripts were produced, particularly what they were written on. Virtually all were written on treated animal skins, and there were essentially two types. The first was parchment, which is made of sheep skin. It has the quality of being very white, but also being thin. It has a naturally greasy surface, which meant it was hard to erase writing from it. This made it much sought after for court documents in medieval times. The second type is vellum, which is calf skin. This was most often used for any very high-status documents because it provided the best writing surface, so scribes could achieve lettering of high quality. So, once the animal hides had been chosen, they had to be prepared. Where the right materials were on hand, the skins were put into large barrels or vats of lime, where they were agitated or stirred frequently. But if lime wasn't available, then the hides were buried. Both these techniques were designed to cause the hair to slough off and the skins to become gelatinous and therefore more flexible. The next stage was to put the hides on stretcher frames and pull them very tight. While on the frame, they were scraped with a moon-shaped knife in order to create a uniform thickness. For parchment, that was the end of the process. But for vellum, there was an additional stage where it was bleached in order to achieve the desired color. So, what does all this preparation mean for the quest to identify the origins of mystery manuscripts? Well, until recently, the only way historians and other academics were able to guess at origins was either through the analysis of the handwriting style or from the dialect in which the piece was written. But these techniques have proven unreliable for a number of reasons. It was thus decided to try to look at the problem from a different angle, to start from what is known, that is, the small number of manuscripts whose origins we do already know. Because these parchments and vellum are both made from animal hides, it was possible to subject them to DNA testing and to identify the genetic markers for the date and location of production. From this was created what is known as a baseline. The next stage was to test the mystery manuscripts, finding their DNA characteristics, and then making comparisons between the known and the mystery scripts. Genetic similarities and differences enabled the scientists to gain more information about the origins of the many manuscripts we had known virtually nothing about up to that point. Now you might ask, what are the potential uses of this new information? Well, obviously, it can shed light on the origin of individual books and manuscripts. But that's not all. It can also shed light on the evolution of the whole of the manuscript production industry in medieval times. And because that was such a thriving business, 
involving very large-scale movements right across the globe. The new data, in turn, help historians establish which trade routes were in operation during the whole millennium. Now, if anyone has any questions... That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to... Dear viewers, thank you for taking this listening test. Please let me know about your score in the comments section below. Keep on practicing. It's the only way to be successful. We are planning to upload more IELTS helpful videos. Please subscribe to our channel, IELTS Listening. Thank you.